Okay, so so it's good to check for this audio thing, just to make sure this this thing, this bar, once I recorded without the audio, just to make sure it's there. Okay, so this is lecture 25. Am I right? It's 25. Okay, so the last thing we were seeing was, uh, uh, was this notion of irregular LDPC codes or more general LDPC codes and I defined a whole bunch of parameters to characterize them. Okay, the block length is, impo is important but as I said usually since these codes are sparse you can conveniently tend the block length to a large number and do it for some suitable block length. So we don't worry about block length as much but we worry about these weight distributions. Okay, there were two ways of defining the weight distribution. One was with respect to the nodes and other one was with respect to the edges okay the node perspective and the edge perspective degree distributions okay so i had notation i think uh, l of x and r of x was were my these two were my uh, node perspective degree distributions and uh, rho, lambda of x and rho of x were edge perspective degree distributions Okay, and there were ways of converting from one to the other. Okay, and I left all of that as exercise. Hopefully, all of you went back and figured it out. It's, it's just basic, simple counting, but I will urge you to make sure you can do that. Okay, because if you don't, if you don't understand that very basic thing, then when I do something else later, it will be confusing. Okay, and remember the convention. The way we wrote down L of X was what? We said it would be sigma i equals so let's say one to some d L. Okay, yeah, L i x to the power i this is how i wrote my l of x okay and i wrote my r of x similarly as summation say i think i used j for these things right so 1 to dr okay let's say i don't know I used rj did we use capital l or small l it was capital l right so capital l and capital r capital r x power j okay and so the important parameter is the rate of the code, right? And rate of the code we saw is just a function of L i and R j, okay? And there was this nice simple way of writing it. Well, the design rate at least, okay? Not maybe not the actual rate. Maybe it's very close to the actual rate, but the design rate worked out as what? Yeah, one minus L prime one divided by R prime one, okay? So that was a it was a convenient way of writing down what uh, the design rate would be. Okay, if you want, you can write it purely in terms of Li's and the Rj's. Okay, so then you would get sigma over i, sigma over j, i times Li. Then for r prime of one, you would get j times Rj. Okay, this is a simple calculation. Okay, and the way we wrote down lambda of x and rho of x, how did that work out? Okay, lambda i. I wrote x power i minus 1. Okay, so there's some uh, convenience factor there. Similarly, rho x is summation j equals 1 to dr uh, rho j x power j minus 1. Okay, I believe there's a relationship between lambda of x and l of x. Okay, I don't know if enough of you realize that. What will be that relationship? Okay, one can show, I think, I'm, I'm I'm quite sure that this is correct, but uh, you might want to check this. Uh, L prime x divided by L prime 1. Am I right? Okay, so this is a very convenient, nice, short way of writing down the relationship between lambda of x and Lx. Right? So if you have L of x, you can find lambda of x kind of in one shot with this formula. Okay, so if, if you find the other formulas complicated to remember, this is one thing to remember. Okay, similarly, rho x will be what yeah r prime x divided by r prime 1 okay so you can also go back actually okay so you can do an integral from 0 to 1 and you will get back get your l of x from lambda of x right so it has to work out the same way right this will work out in that fashion make sure uh, you understand all these simple conversions just basic enumeration and counting but one needs to pay some attention okay so when you do, when you do when you write programs these are the things that will go wrong okay We'll see that you will miss out on these simple things and there'll be all kinds of confusion. Okay, so for instance, one very 
simple confusion is LIs are usually fractions, right? Maybe you have that fraction to 10 decimal places, okay? But your block length is only like 4000, right? Now, if you want to find number of bit nodes of a particular degree, you can never find exactly that many, right? It will only be close to that, okay? So typically in practice, when you construct, you're willing to live with the closest possible approximation. You don't have to hit this LIs and RIs exactly. Up to some error is okay. The performance will not change. Performance of the code will not change. It's not too sensitive to the actual values. Okay, but it, but it should be close enough. You can't just pick some other value and say it's, it will give you the same performance. Okay, so this part hopefully is clear. Hopefully you have thought enough about it. Okay, and how to characterize these things. Okay, so next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take Gallagher A. Okay, hopefully you again remember Gallagher A. We did the analysis for regular codes. I'm going to do an extension of the analysis. I'll, I'll point out the places where you'll have to do some extra work. And then I'm going to work out how that is done. Basically, how do you find threshold for irregular LDPC codes under Gallagher A decoding? So that's the next thing that we're going to see. Okay, so how do you characterize thresholds? First of all, is, is density evolution possible? All those things is what we will uh, look at next. Okay, any questions on these these things? These lambda i's and rho j's and anything you worried about in actual construction? Some of you might take that as your project, right? So you'll have to know it's a good time to bring it up so that others also realize. Okay, it's fine. Okay. All right. So so let's look at uh, Gallagher A. on irregular codes. Okay. So there are quite a few problems. Okay. So first of all, so I, I'll talk with talk about a non problem first. The first thing is can we have Gallagher A on an irregular code? Can you have an irregular Tanner graph and have Gallagher A decoding algorithm? Go back and think about what you had to do. What about the first iteration step A? Can you do that? Yeah, you can do it. It's because a node has different degrees. No, different nodes have different degrees. You don't have a problem, right? You would send as many as you want, right? That's fine. And can you do step B of iteration 1? <coughs> can the check nodes reply back to the bit nodes? That's possible, right? And can you do iteration 2 step A? Right? You have to modify, depending on the number of, the degree of each node, you'll have, different nodes will do different things. But you can do it, right? If all of them agree, then send that value. If there is any disagreement, then send the value that was received out of the channel. Okay, so you modify it slightly. You can run Gallagher A for irregular graphs. Okay, it's very clear. You can go back and check on it, and you can write a program for doing Gallagher A for irregular codes. It's not a problem. So doing Gallagher A is not a problem. Okay, the problem will come next. Okay, so you remember the way we analyzed it. Okay, so you remember how we analyzed it, right? I said, I asked a question, first we, think, first we said all zero code word assumption, right? So all zero code word assumption also is going to be okay, okay? So let me write down what are the things that are okay, okay? So for instance, uh, the running of the algorithm is okay. There's no problem here. It requires some minor modifications, but you can go back and look at it and modify it. There's no problem there. Okay, what about the all zero code word assumption? You remember in our analysis, we use the all zero code word assumption, right? And uh, well, it's also true. Okay, so if, if at all it is true for regular codes, it should be true for irregular codes also, right? And uh, I'm, I don't want to spend too much time again, once again doing that. In fact, I didn't do it. I, do, I didn't do a full fledged proof the last time also. Okay, I just gave you a rough argument for why it should be true. The same arguments will hold here because the, the basic reason is the channel is not changing. It's still symmetric, whether it is zero or one. The channel is doing the exact same things. But whether you have a regular code or irregular code, channel doesn't care, right? So it's still a binary symmetric channel. So the, for the same reason, it will work. Okay, the all zero code word assumption is also okay. Okay, the thing that will differ significantly is neighborhoods. Okay, the neighborhoods of nodes will change. If you have a particular regular irreg irregular Tanner graph, the neighborhood of one bit node need not look the same as the neighborhood of any other bit node. Okay, it will depend on the degree, right? Starting with the first stage itself, it can differ, right? The bit node can have a different degree, which means the number of immediate neighbors itself is different, okay? Right? 
so within one tanagraph one irregular tanagraph you cannot expect all the bits to behave in the same way right so so the error rates for each of the bits will not necessarily be the same as you keep doing your iterations okay okay go back and think about it right so the, in, in the regular case we did we didn't have any problem with that we didn't bother with that right i didn't even explain all that very closely i just said we can look at any one bit node it's the same it's the same as any other bit node i don't have to worry about it okay so that will be one problem okay so one significant problem will be different neighborhoods for different bit nodes okay so this is a problem and uh, and one needs to worry about it a lot because i mean there, there could be various ways of handling it and how you handle it will will change the ease of analysis will change the results that you can get out of it okay one might say for instance the best way the ideal way the proper way of doing the analysis is to fix one tanagraph list out all the different neighborhoods right and then do the analysis for okay so one assumption that will still work is what okay let me i forgot about one more assumption that will work the neighborhoods will be cycle free okay though they are different you can say as n tends to infinity neighborhoods will be cycle free with high probability that you can still say okay so let me say that okay neighborhoods will be will be cycle free or will have no repetition with high probability okay i can still say that okay again why that comes about is just because the graph is sparse okay there's no other reason for that other than that okay so the regularity does not really play into the cycle free nature okay that's not it's not dependent on that so that will also still work so pretty much the only problem is the fact that different bits have different neighborhoods there's no other problem everything else will nicely carry over okay so the only trick you need to be able to analyze gallagher a on irregular ldpc matrices or irregular tana graphs is how do you deal with these different neighborhoods different neighborhoods for different bits okay so like i said one might demand that the only way of doing it is for a, take a particular graph fix a block length take a particular graph enumerate all the possible neighborhoods okay right enumerate all possible neighborhoods and in fact even that is difficult to do right i'm not defining one code for you i'm defining only a an ensemble of codes and depending on which code you pick your neighborhood will change and you can never make any statement about the performance of the code purely based on degree distribution okay so the whole thing gets complicated and at the end of the day the only tool you will be left with is simulations okay so you generate a code with a particular degree distribution you simulate see how well it performs then change your degree distribution then generate another code again simulate you can do it one can do it today it's not too unthinkable okay but it's just impossible to really optimize quickly and get good thresholds you remember what our problem was we already had a 0.04 threshold while the optimal was 0.11 okay you want to get towards that okay and you have no way of knowing beforehand what is the change you have to make right so unless you have a nice tool with which you can analyze there will be you will lose a lot of well, you can you can't really do anything much yeah so so there is a way to deal with these different neighborhoods okay so this is very common to a lot of arguments in coding and information theory in fact i think it's common to many places where there is a common some combinatorial argument involved okay so the idea is to average okay so i cannot calculate anything for one particular graph okay for one particular graph i'm stuck because there are different neighborhoods and i don't know what to do well the neighborhoods are tree like they are cycle free i know that but still the neighborhoods are different right there are different degrees and i cannot calculate anything for a specific case and the specific case may not really mean much so what you do is you average over all possible neighborhoods okay so you find probability of error averaged over all possible neighborhoods so what does it mean you take one neighborhood find its probability of error take another neighborhood find its probability of error another neighborhood find its probability of error do everything and then average if you do that way even then the average is tough to compute right so 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 the idea is you can compute the average without doing the individual case you can use a probabilistic argument very smartly and compute the average directly 
without doing the individual probability of error calculations. If you can manage to do that, well, you have done something, but maybe that is not really the problem that you want to solve. Okay, So that is the first idea. So what is, the, what is idea 1? To deal with this, idea 1 is average over all neighborhoods. Okay, average what? Average probability of error. Okay, so this is what that's what we are trying to calculate. Over all neighborhoods. So you try to find the average probability of error averaged over all neighborhoods and everything that we can receive. See, so far we have been averaging only over all possible channel output. Okay, your input, your channel, the out, the code word was all zero. That was always fixed. And what did we average over when we found probability of error? All possible channel outputs. That's what we were averaging over. Okay. So now I'm saying not only that, not only that, you have to also average over all possible neighborhoods. Okay. First of all, is the first statement clear? The fact that we were averaging over all the output code, the channel outputs. Okay. We were actually averaging, but but we did it smartly, right? How did we do that averaging? We said each bit can be in error with probability p. And we use that and use some independence assumption in the middle. And the independence assumption is crucial in making your average calculation easy. Okay. So once you did that, you were able to do the do the average calculation without really enumerating each possible output code word, right? So and go back and notice how the independence assumption is crucial. If you didn't make it, you can't do that. Okay. So once you do that, once you have some independence holding, okay, you can do this average calculation without enumerating each and every independent case. Each and every case, you don't have to enumerate. Okay, so that is the crucial thing. So you average over all neighborhoods without finding the individual probabilities of error. Okay, so once you can do that using your independence assumptions, at least one part of it is will be solved. You can find something. Okay, the next step is to show that this something is meaningful, that this average probability of error is actually meaningful. So okay, for that, the idea two is to show what's called a concentration result. Okay, so this is a standard trick in a lot of combinatorial problems. If you are used to, if you have seen a lot of problems, in, including in fact channel coding. Okay, so uh, the whole uh, the whole area is based on these kind of arguments. So you average over several realizations and then you show a concentration argument or an existence. Okay, so in several cases concentration will be tough, existence will be easy. Okay, so you can show once you find an average, it's like saying suppose suppose I say the average mark in a class is 50, which means there's at least one guy who got greater than or equal to 50, and there's one guy who got less than or equal to 50. So finding the average is meaningful to some extent. It shows you existence on either side. Okay, But concentration is stronger. What does concentration mean? Every single instance is actually very, very close to the average. It's like saying everybody is, is a genius in class. Everybody got 100 out of 100. right? So it's concentrated tightly around the average. Okay, Typically, it never happens in class. right? Okay, so you, you will never get your average marks to concentrate. Okay, but here you can show that result. Okay, you can show that in this problem, your average probability of error is a very good indicator of a random instance because every random instance is going to concentrate tightly around your average. Okay, so it's like think of a Gaussian PDF, right? So your sigma is tending to zero. Okay, so everything is at the mean. Okay, so everything is at the mean. Okay. Or the tail probabilities are going to vanish uh, almost zero. Anything outside of the main plus or minus sigma is gone. Okay. So if you can show these two, then you have you have some consolation. Okay. Well, you have not really solved the exact problem. You have not found the probability of error for a particular case, or you can't even make an argument like that. But I know that I can find for the average case based on some independence assumptions, and then I will show a concentration result which justifies my uh, argument okay okay so i have not really done anything concrete yet but i'm just giving you a flavor for what is what is going to come okay so that's what we'll do so what i will do in this course is i will expand on idea 1 a little bit i'll actually do how show you how to do the computation okay little bit hopefully i think we will derive the exact density evolution uh, equations for gallagher a at least okay so we'll do that idea 2 i will just outline briefly okay so i'll I will I will not do the whole thing in great detail and if you are interested I will urge you to learn more about martingales okay the concentration result comes because of 
martingales okay so you have to study a specific type of construction called dub martingale which and then you it's used okay you can you can look at modern coding theory the book i talked about they explain this in great detail okay it's not difficult okay when you see martingale you immediately think it's some fancy thing it's not very difficult but it requires some background which which we will not see in this class but uh, i will encourage you to look at the proof okay it's not a, it's not a very difficult proof to understand okay so let's go to the finding the average uh, average performance over all neighborhoods okay <clears throat> so so i'll call it density evolution for the irregular case <clears throat> okay for the regular case we know how to do this and we will use the regular case a little bit okay we will see we will borrow from there and we will also make those independence assumptions which are justified by the cycle free nature okay those things are all justified we will do all of that and compute the average case okay all right so okay so all right so let's start at the very beginning so iteration 1 step a okay i'll do it slightly differently i mean at least for the first few things i'll do slowly and then i'll do the general result uh, reasonably so what is this iteration 1 step a okay you received something from the channel from the channel and each bit node is simply sending exactly what it received on every edge so what's the probability that you will a particular edge will have an erroneous message p okay right so that's very clear in the first iteration you can even find the probability of error for a particular edge you don't have to average you don't have to do anything okay right is that clear so for the first step there is no confusion okay but even if you average what will happen if i average over all possible instances you will still get p because it's all constant right so there is real tight full complete concentration <laughs> everything is p is no problem okay so that's fine so i'll call that p0 okay p0 is p okay that's fine now for step b <coughs> you need some work you'll see immediately you'll have to average if you don't average you can't say much but before that let me let me go slowly okay <coughs> okay so what step b i have a check node say the degree of the check node is j okay we start with that uh, check node of degree j i have to say that now right for the regular case what would it be always wr okay there's no problem i can take any old check node there's no problem now i have to tell you which check node i'm taking okay so i'm going to, i'm going to do that okay suppose i knew that the edge the edge i'm looking at okay so so again once again remember what what should i do now okay i'm trying to find q 0 right this is what this is what i'm trying to find what is the definition for q 0 now probability that a message from check node to bit node is an error okay but that will depend on which edge i choose right so now i'm going to say i'm going to choose some edge which i know is connected to a check node of degree j on the right hand side okay so given that my edge is connected to a check node of degree j on the right hand side i will try to find q0 okay this is not q0 exactly q0 given that check node edge is connected to a check node of degree j on the right hand side <coughs> okay that is what i'm going to compute first and then i will average over all possible check nodes and pro using the probability to get my average okay that's what i'm going to do so what does this mean how do i how do i do this it would have had j minus 1 incoming messages in the step a iteration okay and based on my independence assumption what do i know all these guys will be independent right and they are independent and they are all equally likely to be in error with probability p okay fine for step a was just p there was no problem okay so that i know <coughs> is that clear okay so i'll do the iid assumption each of these guys are independent and they're equally likely to be in error with probability p okay so if i do that what will be the probability that this is an error 
yeah exactly so it will be same as before right 1 minus 1 minus 2 p raised to the power j minus 1 divided by 2 okay so basically probability that a odd number of odd number of messages out of this j minus 1 are in error you write it out in a complicated way you can also equivalently write it in this form okay it works out in that fashion there's no problem okay <coughs> now this is not enough for me see i have to find average performance over averaged over all possible tana graphs and all possible received values i'm averaging only over all possible received bits for a particular edge that is connected to a check node of degree j okay so now i have to pick a random edge okay and allow my tana graph to be all possible all possible tana graphs over all possible tana graphs i'm going to ask a question okay so the next question i'm going to ask is crucial i'm going to say suppose i select an edge okay and then vary my tana graph over all possible tana graphs what is the probability that my edge would be connected to a check node of degree j okay <coughs> okay is the question reasonably clear to you so one way of doing it is you fix an edge you enumerate all the tana graphs which had with which have various check nodes connected to the edge various bit nodes connected to that count all of those cases where the check node connected to it had degree j divide by the total number of tana graphs you will get one number okay that is the number i am trying to find out okay so i fixed an edge and then i'm trying to find out over all possible tana graphs what's going to happen okay so there's another way of quickly doing that okay so you can say based on the way i'm constructing my sockets based on my socket construction i can quickly answer that question okay i can say what can i say how many edges are there that are connected to degree j check nodes okay there will be so many edges right i can divide that by the total number of edges that will also give me the same number okay well all these things are slightly hand waving arguments but hopefully you have done enough problems and counting problems to convince yourself okay so i have a given number of edges right i know there are so many edges that are connected to degree j check nodes okay if i divide that number by the total number of edges i should get the probability that a randomly chosen edge from this tana graph is connected to a check node of degree j on the right okay and then even if i average over all possible graphs i'll get the same number okay so think about it a little bit but this is the this is the easiest way of convincing yourself you have so many edges connected to degree j check nodes okay divide that number by the total number of edges that will be the probability that a randomly chosen edge from a particular tana graph is connected to a check node of degree j when you vary over all possible graphs you'll get the same same number again <coughs> okay so what is that number the number of edges connected to check nodes of degree j on the right divided by total number of edges that is rho j okay so you see probability that a random edge <coughs> is connected to <coughs> a check node of degree j equals rho j okay in a particular graph okay so you have to extrapolate from here a little bit and say if i fix an edge okay the fraction of graphs on which i will have a check node of degree j connecting on the right side will also be rho j okay so it's not a very difficult computation to do from here one can do that okay so once i know that 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 is my rho j i can average i can find the average uh, probability of error over all my graphs or all my realizations okay so that's what i do and how will i do that i'll multiply rho j by this probability of error and add over all j okay so that's my average probability of error. okay so my q0 is going to be summation rho j times 1 minus 1 minus 2p raised to the power j minus 1 divided by 2 and j well one goes from 1 to dr <coughs> whatever my value is all yeah yeah kind of doing 
doing some kind of thing like that but i i want to i want to bring that distinction in a little bit just so that people can think more about this averaging process okay so it's, it's i mean if you're convinced about this formula then you are happy there's no problem you can be convinced in various ways but if you want to think about the averaging over all graphs am i doing that correctly or am i just picking one edge averaging over all edges am i doing all those things you can think about it but both of them are the same you will get the same you will get the same answer okay so that's q0 okay is that fine okay so if i pick some edge okay the probability that that edge is going to carry an erroneous message averaged over all graphs and all outputs is q0 in step b of iteration okay so now <coughs> now i'll jump to an i'll jump to iteration l okay iteration l step a i'll assume until then everything has been done which means what i, I already have q okay so I, am i doing this correctly should i do p1 q1 because why did i put zero here so i think i should do one right so this one okay. it's okay i mean i don't know did we do p0 or did we do zero or one zero we did zero before okay okay fine <coughs> that's fine i don't know i don't like calling this q0 i'll call this q1 okay call this q1 okay sorry about that we call this q1 okay so i i finished up to iteration l which means what is known to me i know ql no ql minus 1 right l minus 1 or l <coughs> l minus 1 okay after i finish iteration iteration 1 i know q1 okay okay so after i do iteration when i'm ready to do iteration l i know q l minus 1 i'm done with iteration l minus 1 okay so i want to look at iteration l q l minus 1 is known okay so what is known is probability that in an in any edge i would have an erroneous message okay so now you go back and look at the bit node and ask the same question and you'll get the answer very easily okay suppose i say my bit node has degree i okay which means there are i minus 1 different messages that were received in iteration l minus 1 from okay from i know different check nodes and all this information is independent okay right i'll again make the iid assumption okay so what i'm what am i going to say any one here okay so i'll make the iid assumption here what is the iid assumption going to be that any one particular edge is going to carry an erroneous message with probability ql and the fact that another edge carries an erroneous message is also is is, is independent of it and that probability is also ql okay so i'm making that iid assumption okay that iid assumption needs to be justified and can be justified when you do the when when you look at the cycle tree and behold but i will make that iid assumption okay any two edges the fact that they carry an erroneous message is independent are independent that those, those two events are independent and they are they have the same probability okay so this needs to be justified later like like before we'll justify it with the with the cycle free assumption but once you do that it's very easy to do the same computation again okay so i can easily find pl how will i write pl <coughs> okay so you know you're going to sum over 1 to dl lambda i this is you're going to do okay and then given that you have a bit node of degree i connected to it you redo your same formula as before what's your same formula as before 1 minus p times i'm sorry q l minus 1 q l minus 1 raised power. to the power, power. i minus 1 plus p into p times 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus q 1 minus q l minus 1 raised to the power i minus 1 sir yes here we are also assuming that the edges are uh, 
very nicely mixed up. That is, for a degree I bit node, I am averaging over all the possible tanagraphs. So why will it not be mixed up? It will be properly nicely mixed up. It's no problem. So the averaging gets rid of all these confusions about should I worry about which bit node can it be possibly connected to? Should I worry about which, which? See, that's the problem, right? You cannot do it for an individual case because there are just too many possibilities. A bit node can be connected to so many check nodes and all of them can have the same degree. Which means this is no real point, you know. I mean, you, the average doesn't... So averaging just gets rid of all those specific cases. I don't have to worry about the actual connection. I don't have to worry about anything. It will be nicely, wonderfully mixed up. Get rid of the whole thing. <coughs> the fact that such a mixed up number has a meaning comes from the concentration result. If you didn't have a concentration result, then there's not, not much point. <coughs> okay? So how will I do QL now? No, or QL plus 1, I'm sorry. QL, huh? yes. is it okay? Yeah, QL. <coughs> How will I do QL now? Same thing as before, right? I already have that written down. So, since I have a convenient, this should be PL minus 1, no? Okay. Okay, so I have to do some minor changes here. I'll do that. So you can do L here, <coughs> then raise it to the power J minus 1. Okay, so 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 I think I think that's why I wanted to call this also P1. Okay, so maybe I'll just say this is equal to P1 now. Okay, so I'll say I'll say P1 equals P. Is that fine? Okay, if you want to be very specific, this works out. Okay. okay. So that is my density evolution for irregular LDPC codes for Gallagher A, and uh, and I mean I don't know how convinced you are about all these averaging arguments. Go back and think about it, and it's okay. No, I mean enough people have looked at it, so <laughs> it can be. It's it's true. Okay, start with the assumption that it's true, and then <laughs> work yourself into convincing. Uh, I mean, convince yourself based on that. Okay, so that's the best way of uh, proceeding. Okay, so I'm going to try and give you an interpretation for these equations from the neighborhood point of view. So you remember, for the regular case, we could go to a neighborhood of depth L. Right, a particular neighborhood of depth L because all the neighborhoods look the same. And given my IID assumption, I could say the the lowest, no, the deepest uh, edges they have a probability of error p. The next one has q1, q p1, like that. Right? We could we could build it up like that. Okay. So a picture like that for irregular codes is tough to build. First of all, why? <coughs> you don't have one neighborhood. Okay. So I'm, I have to average over for each for each depth, there will be an averaging. Okay, so I have to keep on averaging. Okay, so so but but that picture still holds. Okay, so that picture is what justifies your your uh, independence IID assumptions. <coughs> okay, so that picture is called actually the tree ensemble. Okay, you can read the modern coding theory book. So they, there they have something called a tree ensemble. They define all possible trees of depth L, and then they talk about averaging over those things. Okay, and then each each there is a degree distribution also involved at each step and it's, it's a little bit confusing to see w what that is but but one, one can actually have a neighborhood picture also for irregular codes yeah, that's important to know all right so that's the that's idea one like i said idea two we will not spend i, I don't know if i want to really spend any time on so what it means is <coughs> this average behavior <coughs> is as good as what you would get for a random case. So if you generated a random enough LDPC matrix, right, that obeys a particular degree distribution, its performance and the average performance will be very, very similar. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> so strictly speaking, what I should do is I should go to the tree ensemble, right? I should define the tree ensemble and then start from the deepest nodes and then give you an argument for how the next step would be, next step would be, next step would be, and then give you PL as what happens at the root. Okay, so that's the proper way of doing it. Okay, so I just gave you a simple way of convincing yourself for why that should be true even without going doing all that. Okay, so that's the proper way of doing it, and you can see modern coding theory in that book. They have done it that way. Okay, so it's possible to do it properly also. Okay, but if I write down that neighborhood and then start giving you arguments. More, more people will be lost than this. But this is a simple enough argument to see and understand. Okay, random edge, probability, rho j, lambda j. It's easy to, easier to see than anything. Else. <coughs> will you get the same expression if you look at the neighborhood? Yeah, you'll get the exact same expression. Okay, because again there you have to worry about an edge. You will have you will have so many edges at a particular depth. You have to worry about edges. All right. So, so what has happened at the after you do after you did all that? Okay. So even if you did not understand the individual evolution steps, at the end of the day, what has happened? You have a miraculous formula for P L as a function of what? P L minus one comma P. Okay. And what are the what is it parameterized by? Lambda. Rho and lambda. <coughs> Okay, so this is your density evolution iteration. <coughs> okay, some f it is, but but you know there is an f like this. Okay, so then you go ahead and do the same analysis as before. What do you have to show now? You have to show some monotonicity properties. You have to say this will be a decreasing function of L of PL, PL minus 1, decreasing function of P, all those things you have to show, okay? And then slowly you can find, then then what, what is the next thing we worried about? Yeah, what happens as L tends to infinity, okay? So you know it's bounded, right? The sequence PL is going to be bounded, so it will converge. The question is, does it converge to 0 or does it converge to a non-zero finite value, okay? So you run this iteration several times and find the maximum p for which pl will converge to 0 and that will be my threshold. Okay, So you can define a threshold. <coughs> okay, So threshold p star is I have to strictly say supremum. Okay, So I, one can replace it by maximum if you are not convinced or comfortable with the word supremum. Supremum over all p such that pl tends to <coughs> okay. All right. So that will be my threshold. Okay. So again, the ultimate way to convince yourself that the threshold is true is what? Similar to what we did before. What should you do? I'm sorry. Simulate. So you take the same degree distribution, find its threshold based on your density evolution you find this p star and then you increase your block length right do you see the behavior very close to the threshold you, you saw you, you remember what i showed you for the regular case okay, you can do it for the irregular case also you'll see it will behave close to threshold in fact it will behave close to threshold even if you have cycles of length 6 and all that even if your neighborhoods are have cycles okay like i said that's still one of the unsolved problems in ldpc codes why is it that these algorithms behave so well even when you're assumptions in the analysis fail okay so well there should be other analysis out there right? so that's the answer to that question okay so that's all that is true for irregular codes as well <coughs> okay but there is one advantage to with irregular codes which we did not have for regular codes we have these extra degrees of freedom in rho and lambda okay so you can go fool around with them change them and optimize your threshold to get <coughs> a suitable rho and lambda Okay, so you can now do optimization over rho and lambda to get the best possible threshold for a given rate or get the best possible rate for a given threshold. You can do either of those optimizations. Okay, so that's what's I mean good good about irregular codes. Okay, optimization over rho and lambda is now possible. Okay, previously we didn't have that. Well, one can say previously you could have optimized over 
WR and WC for a particular rate. But for a particular rate, that space is not varied enough, right? If you say rate half, what are the WRs and WCs? 3, 6, 4, 8, 5, 10 and quickly you will see it will start to degenerate. But if you fix rate as half and look at all the possible row, rows and lambdas based on my equation, you will see there are so many of them and there is bound to be something which will give you a better threshold than what it was. Okay? So, <coughs> that is one of the another thing to remember. Whenever you do optimization, you want your space over which you are searching to be large. Okay? Only then you can hope for something good. If the space is only 10 or 20, there is no point in trying to optimize. Okay? It has to be very big. It is good to have a var variation in your uh, uh, landscape, so to speak. Okay? Okay, so, <coughs> how is this optimization done? I am going to briefly outline, again, not in great detail. I will briefly outline how the optimization is done and you will see how it works. Okay, the first thing is, look at the design rate. <coughs> okay, let me write it down. R I wrote as 1 minus. Okay, let me write it down explicitly in terms of rho j's and lambda j's. Rho j divided by j divided by summation lambda i divided by i. Okay, so there is a very famous conjecture in LDPC codes that right regular graphs give you capacity achieving thresholds. Okay, I am sorry? Yeah, it is a conjecture. Nobody has proven this. Right regular in the sense almost right regular. So, you remember the example I gave. I asked you to assume that the right degrees were only W and W plus 1. Okay, and I asked you to find something, right? You remember? Okay, so that is one of the assumptions made here. First, first assumptions that will be made to simplify your search space. Okay, you want your search space to be large, but you don't want it to be too large also. Then you'll be totally lost. Okay, so to curtail that a little bit, people usually make a, uh, a right regular assumption. Well, not really regular, but right close to regular assumption. Okay. Yeah, almost. So you say rho w and rho w plus 1 are non zero. Okay, and rho j equals 0 for all j not equal to w w plus 1. Okay, so you say that first. So that simplifies your so now you have to only search over w. Okay, so that, that makes your dependence uh, for the for the as far as the rho is concerned. <coughs> okay. Right? Is that clear enough? I am sorry? Just to simplify the optimization problem. Otherwise, there are too many variables, right? Suppose I say this goes from 1 to dr. You need something, but you do not need too many things. Okay, let, let me come back. Okay, I will I'll come close. Okay, so, so for instance, if I say dl is 100 and dr is 100, how many variables do I have? 200 variables. That is probably way too much. Okay, but if I say DL is 100 and DR is, the numerator is completely only one variable, it's okay. I mean, 100 is good enough. I mean, I don't need more than 100 variables to optimize. You may not get too much there. Okay. <coughs> is that clear? Okay. So, another thing that's done. So, so what do you want to do now? Next, ne next you have to characterize all the lambda i's which will give you a particular rate. So, usually you fix a design rate. Okay. Say half. So, you fixed rate to be half, okay, and then you fixed your row almost, right. Then you find all possible lambdas which will satisfy this rate equation. And then you have to find what? You have to find thresholds for each of those lambdas and pick that one which gives you the best possible threshold. That is one way of viewing the problem. If that was the only way of solving the problem, it would not have been very successful because finding the threshold would be very painful and there would be too many cases. Okay? But it is possible to phrase this as a linear optimization problem. <coughs> okay? It is possible to convert it into a linear optimization problem. See, remember, the, the way you do that there, the way you do there is, it is slightly different. You try to maximize the rate and keep the threshold fixed. Okay? That is also possible. You fix the design threshold, fix the, fix the design rate and try to maximize threshold. That is one approach. Okay, as I said, this is a fine approach. I mean, it's not wrong. One can do it. Okay, but a better approach, which will give you some linear programming, linear optimization 
problems is if you do the reverse you fix the threshold and maximize your rate okay you fix the threshold and try to maximize your rate if you do that you will get a linear problem you can see why right see what is maximizing rate if your row is fixed maximizing the rate is same as minimizing this entire expression which means maximizing denominator what kind of a function is the denominator in terms of lambda it's a linear function okay so trying to maximize r fixing a threshold can potentially give you a linear programming problem okay but fixing a threshold what does it mean the constraints might now become non linear okay but go back and look at the constraints <coughs> at least one of these expressions is a linear function of lambda okay so but that's not really the only constraint there are other constraints look at this function which is a linear function of lambda right so it's also possible to modify your constraints so that all your constraints become linear okay both of those are possible okay so if you for instance choose to do the project or the term paper which is optimization of degree distributions you might have to look at how that problem is converted into a linear programming problem okay there is no great concept there it's just a technique of viewing it properly so that you can con con so that you convert all your <coughs> constraints and objective functions to linear functions and you run linear program by now if you're not sure if you if you do not know if you only have a linear objective function and linear constraints it can be solved there is an algorithm which can solve it okay okay that's that's also known so one can do this <coughs> reasonably fast okay so i mean i know i've not done a very great comprehensive discussion of irregular codes part of it is intentional part of it is also because there's really nothing much more that one needs to do okay <coughs> just a question of going in there and running this complicated linear programming problems with 100 variables okay i can't run that for you here in class it doesn't make much sense okay i can only show you how these things work out okay so <coughs> so that's the that's the high point of irregular codes and it turns out if you do this optimization you can get to get very very close to capacity okay so it, this is enough pretty much it will give you thresholds that are very close to capacity and then you don't worry about too many other things it's, that's enough for you okay so clear any questions any something that's disturbing you based on what i wrote down <coughs> how close can we get to point 11 for the bsc it's not very clear okay the actually the jury is out people don't know how close one can get for the binary symmetric channel if i change the channel i do something else for instance for the awgn channel you can get very 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 close for the bsc i'm not quite sure i think you, you can get very close but i'm not very sure how close it is <coughs> okay so so that's roughly the reason and motivation for irregular codes and why it's very useful in practice so in practice for instance the ymax codes which are actually in the standards are irregular okay and they are right regular okay so they yes but but they may may not be the same see this is an approximation of awgn but the okay the question was isn't the binary symmetric channel uh, can be seen as a con so an approximation of the awgn channel okay but it turns out the kind of information you get is so much more powerful in awgn and that that variety is not there in bsc okay in the bsc you don't get much information the information content in the awgn is more colorful and nice so you get better capacity so that's the loose way of saying it but uh, i don't know how else to quantify it but i think in my opinion it should be possible to even get get close to bsc capacity that's what i think i might be wrong <coughs> people have shown some weird results but yeah i mean bsc is not a particularly difficult channel but but the but it's not great you know i mean for awgn for instance if you do bpsk awgn minus 1 plus 1 right 0.5 and 0.7 okay are they different if you receive 0.5 is it different from receiving 0.7 okay bsc would say no right In the bsc you don't distinguish but 0.5 and 0.7 can be different if you actually use that number they can give you different answers so so maybe maybe the kind of information you get is different maybe that plays a role I'm not sure I mean, could be but the capacity is clearly lower right 1 minus uh, h of p is much lower than the bps not, not much lower right? 
many cases lesser than significantly lesser than the capacity you can get with uh, BPSK AWS. <coughs> Okay, is that fine? Everybody is happy? It's no problem. So we have about half an hour, 25 minutes, half an hour to go. Should we should we do the project discussion now or should we proceed and do the project discussion in the last 10 minutes? What should we do? Okay, we'll do the project discussion now. Okay, well, I think I, I want to also assign projects to people. So that will also take some time. So we'll stop here for today and do the talk about projects and uh, we'll pick up from here. I, I'll do soft decoding next. Okay, so next thing is BPSK, AWG, and what do you do with LDPC codes in that case? Okay.